Good evening. This is the August 17th, 2022 meeting of the Oyster River Cooperative School Board. Our first item of business tonight is the approval of the agenda. We have a motion for the approval of the agenda. Brian? So moved. Second from Den Denise. Any discussion or changes? All those in favor of the agenda as proposed? Six in favor of the agenda is approved. Six in favor and the student rep in favor of the agenda is approved. All right, our next item is public comment. I have four people so far um, signed up for public comment tonight. So um, we will just invite you to come up to the podium here. You'll have three minutes um, each. And under the, under the recently passed state law, um, we will also keep the public comment period open for 30 minutes for anybody else who arrives um, after our normal public comment period. So uh, just, just in case anybody else does, does arrive. Um, so three minutes and um, yeah. So our first speaker is Deanna Pokenton from Durham. Hello, can you hear me okay? Thank you so much. I am Deanna Pilkington of Durham. I have a, am a parent of four, one graduate of the high school and three who are still in the school system. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Be Smart for Kids effort, which is on the agenda of tonight's school board meeting. I am a healthcare provider and also an adjunct professor at UNH, and recently I had to update my statistics to share with students and patients that for the first time in history, firearms are now the leading cause of death in American children and teens. While most pediatric and primary care practices routinely discuss gun storage and safety, the effort to raise awareness must expand beyond healthcare offices, which may only interact with the family once a year. School districts are perfectly positioned to regularly and easily reach households with children and teens in our community. Be Smart for Kids is a non-political and non-partisan effort to raise awareness for firearm safety, including safe storage practices, suicide awareness, normalizing the conversations around the presence of guns in homes. This is a public health and public safety effort bringing together volunteers who are gun owners and gun safety advocates alike to prioritize the safety of our children in our community. Thousands of Be Smart volunteers are delivering this message across communities in all 50 states. According to Be Smart Statistics and the American Academy of Pediatrics, 4.6 million children in the U.S. live in a household with at least one loaded, unlocked gun. Every year, 350 children gain easy access to a firearm and unintentionally shoot themselves or someone else. That's nearly one a day. Nearly 700 children in America die by firearm suicide every year. That's about two a day. Three quarters of all school shooters acquire their firearms from the home of a parent or a close relative. As you know, our community and the Seacoast area has been touched by incidents like these. It's been very close to home. As of December 2021, more than two million students nationwide will attend schools with firearm awareness policies. Schools in New Hampshire and in Maine have adopted Be Smart tools to raise awareness as well. We can do the same. I'll share a few examples of information that we have, including posters, cards, fact sheets, and safe storage documents, which could also be shared electronically with our community. This is one example. <laughs> Um, and this poster is just big enough for you to be able to see. S stands for secure all guns in your home and vehicles. M, model responsible behavior around guns. A, ask about the presence of unsecured guns in other homes. R, recognize the role of guns in suicide. And T, tell your peers to be smart. Thank you so much for your time. I know we have a couple other speakers who will also follow up with more ideas on how we can be proactive in this effort. And I'll leave these samples for you here. Thank you. And our next speaker is Jennifer Lyon from Lee. Good evening. Um, I'm a parent of five in the district. And tonight we're here to ask you to help us normalize the conversation around gun safety. Um, by promoting these principles, um, just as our children have become accustomed to lockdown drills, we hope that adults can be accustomed to discussing safe gun storage at home. 41% of adults in New Hampshire own a gun. One study found that 70% of parents believe their teen cannot access that gun. 
Yet the study also found that half the teens said that they would be able to gain access to a loaded gun within one hour, and two thirds said they could do it within five minutes. As Deanna explained, safe gun storage is essential to prevent gun accidents and gun violence, and we adults can work together in our community. We ask that the school board convey the message that safe gun storage is a district expectation. In the packet, we provided a sample resolution, which includes three concrete actions that the district could take. First, the district could direct administration staff to update student handbooks to include information about safe firearm storage and um, the legal obligations to keep guns away from minors. Um, second, the district could create a letter to explain the importance of secure gun storage and legal obligations to protect minors from accessing unsecured guns. And we provided a sample letter in the packet that can also be distributed um, electronically throughout the school year in, in a variety of ways. We know that Principal Noe last April um, provided a link to the Be Smart app um, information. There's a website. So there's many ways to get that information to parents. And frequent reminders are helpful, especially before vacations when children will be home more. Third, the district could commit to continue to work with law enforcement agencies, health agencies, and nonprofits to collaborate and increase efforts to inform parents. This resolution for these three actions fits with the efforts already in place under the district policy KLG to cooperate, quote, cooperate with law enforcement agencies to the extent necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of students, staff, and visitors to the school. This would simply add safe firearm storage to that conversation. It is our hope that by normalizing this conversation, parents will feel more comfortable talking with each other about this issue, and we can all work together to keep firearms secure in our community. So we ask you to re um, resolve to take these three um, actions as a district. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren Selig of Durham. Good evening, I am Lauren Selig from Durham. I am the mother of two Oyster River High School students and I'm also a former teacher. As you've heard from Deanna and Jennifer, we can see a clear problem, which is the need to reduce gun violence in any way we can, especially knowing we have lost members of the Oyster River community to gun violence including when both our student rep and my daughter were fifth graders, one of their classmates. We know that children who experience multiple adverse childhood experiences, including witnessing trauma, are much more likely to have significant learning and emotional challenges as they develop, and that teachers and first responders who have to face the aftermath of school and other gun violence often never recover from that trauma. Clearly, any steps that we can take to mitigate the trauma are good steps. We have identified a simple concrete action the school system can take, which is to put into place the Be Smart program, which we know can make a difference. With a lot of confusion in, the New Hampshire, in New Hampshire regarding federal and state laws and first responders, we should look to these local actions to help to prevent this type of tragedy from ever happening. Also, if the board does need more information, our group is prepared to come in um, in order to decide whether or not to make a proclamation and put in a policy about Be Smart. We can return with a PowerPoint presentation with additional information and go into more detail. We also have a group of concerned citizens who are willing to come to school events to do tabling. We can provide additional documentations for handouts for superintendent and principals to hand out, et cetera, whatever support we can provide. In closing, I'd like to say, according to many religious traditions, if you save one life, you save the world. By enacting the SMART program, think of how many worlds we just might save. We thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And Timothy Horgan from Durham. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me or should I take the mask off? Um, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, I've uh, recently had a, uh, I'm a, a, a little over a week past a positive COVID test, so I want to be as safe as possible. So I'm Tim Horrigan. I don't have any children in the school district, but I was a child in the school district. I was an alumnus of the old Oyster River Junior High School, the last vestiges of which were recently torn down. And I must say, uh, much as I have great memories of the old school, this. This is a very beautiful school, which puts the old one to shame. So I'm very pleased with it. Um, I'm a uh, 
one of our state reps in Durham, and um, there's an election coming up, and actually one of my fellow candidates just spoke, and I, I agree 100% with what she said about the Be Smart program. Um, I know there's gonna be some pushback from it from certain people in, in Concord, but it's a excellent proposal, and that's something the school should definitely get behind. So I think guns were one of the three issues I came here to underline, obviously, very briefly. One is, uh, I'll do them in ascending order of uh, importance. One of them is the free menstrual products, which I've noticed you're providing in the all gender restrooms, which anybody, any member of the school district or whatever their gender uh, affiliation or age may be who's using them. So that's, uh, that's an excellent, excellent thing. There was some uh, resistance to that this year, which was sad. Um, also, um, free school meals, that's a very complicated issue, but we've had those for the last couple of years. And I think that's something that should be continued in the future. And um, there's actually a subcommittee in Concord that's meeting um, in the next month to uh, discuss how to do that. It's something that the state actually can't afford. And the biggest thing is the guns in school, or actually I should say the absence of guns in school. This uh, facility was built with security in mind. And, um, but right now, and uh, it, you did a great job building it, but like the gun laws that we have in the state don't support it. So I think certainly at a minimum, private public schools should have the same right that all private schools and other institutions have, which is to uh, not let people in with guns if that's what they want. And I'm sure that's probably what you would, what you, what you would want. And there's uh, been a, uh, fairly simple common sense law that's been introduced several times and it's been um, squashed for various, uh, what I think are foolish reasons. Like one case, the Republican chair of the House Education Committee was more worried about a hunter who might wander on the school land and not know that he's on school land than he was about the children who might be killed by someone with a gun. So this is, uh, even though, um, even though the odds of it happening in any one school at any time are, are small, this is a fear that I know is uh, pervasive everywhere, including at the Oyster River schools. And um, there's a lot of things we should be doing to make our uh, children, our teachers, and everybody in the community feel safer. So and I, I plan to, uh, I've been working that in the past, and if reelected, I plan to uh, work on those issues in the future. So thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to the approval of the minutes. From August 3rd, we have both regular and non-public minutes. Brian? Motion to approve. We have motion to approve the regular and non-public minutes from uh, August 3rd. We have a second? Second, second. from Denise. Do you have any discussion or corrections? Yeah, Denise? I just have one in the non-public. Um, Dr. Morse was there in person. It was not via telephone. That is correct. Other corrections or additions to the minutes from August 3rd? All right, with that, with that correction, all those in favor of approving the minutes from August 3rd, regular and non-public? Six in favor and the student rep in favor, the minutes are approved. Announcements, commendations, and comments from the district? I'm gonna play rock, paper, scissors, decide who goes first. Good evening, David Goldsmith, Principal of Moharimut. Um, I'm just uh, reminding everybody uh, here and at home uh, that we have two upcoming events before the start of school that are traditional Moharim Moharimut events. Next Monday, the 22nd from six to seven is a get together for new families to Moharimut in grades one through four. And then the following Monday on the 29th from six to seven is our special kindergarten orientation and open house for all kindergarten families at Moharimut. We'll have uh, the PTO at both events. Thank you very much to them for, for joining us as always and partnering with us. Um, transportation will be at the kindergarten event. Kindergartners and their families will be able to take a little bus ride, get all ready for the school year. So we're really excited about that and we can't wait to see all the students on the 31st. Could you just go right ahead and talk about the preparations you've made for the opening of school? Since it's part of my agenda, I was just going to call you back up. So, oh. so if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, in regards to what specifically, Dr. Morris? Um, where the construction project is in the playground. Oh, sure. Yep. Uh, safety we, issues. Yep. We're in the middle of um, two projects that we're finishing up in the school. We've been having air handlers uh, redone in the library 
um, areas and those are almost finished. Everything is installed and they're just putting back together everything they had to dismantle in order to uh, make it happen. So uh, our custodial staff has been doing a great job keeping that uh, keeping up with that and they are ready to have those spaces completely ready by the beginning of school. The old fence and retaining wall uh, on the playground which had started leaning a lot uh, was taken away uh, and a new retaining wall has been put in that is completely done. The fence uh, company will be coming I believe next week to, to put the fence on top of that and then there'll be some touch up work that has to happen but the playground is still being used um, and that area is just roped off for now and it'll be set for school as well. We um, uh, continue to partner with all of the emergency services in town to review all of our procedures. We're having a walkthrough with uh, police departments next week to finally, really, COVID stopped us from the beginning of re learning the map of our school. We had, if you remember, right before the shutdown, we had the addition to the front of our school, and then we had the renovations inside the school. And uh, it's important that all of the responders understand the full map of our building. And now that that has changed again, we always do walkthroughs with uh, police departments, um, anyone who would be responding to our school, fire departments. So we're organizing those. Um, we have our teachers ready, our classrooms look wonderful, uh, and we're, we're really excited. Questions? Thoughts? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Jay Bashar, the principal at the middle school. I'll start uh, in terms of the planning that's going on behind the scenes for emergency type stuff. Uh, Dr. Morris, myself, Bill Sullivan, the Durham Police Department and the Durham Fire Department, we all met today uh, to start talking about what those emergency plans are. Uh, the Fire Department's very pleased with our evacuation plans and we've all already planned some drills for the start of the academic year. So we feel really good about that, particularly now that the site is getting to the point where it's at. And with that, I'll share that the playground is actually completed out back. We're just waiting for the wood chips to be laid out and that'll happen this week. I've already got some uh, emails from neighborhood people saying, hey Jay, people are using the equipment already at night and that's okay, it's a community space. So uh, Principal Goldsmith, after our leadership meeting yesterday, he actually tested out the equipment himself. So he <laughs> gave it a stamp of approval. Uh, supply lists, student supply lists are actually on the Oyster River Metal web uh, middle school website. So if anyone's still looking for that, you can find that there. A uh, new student orientation is actually next week, August 24th from 9.30 to 11.30. Doris Demers is going to feed those new students. Uh, as of right now, we have over 20 new families to our school community. So we look forward to welcoming them. The grade five meet and greet. Uh, that's actually Monday night from four to five o'clock. That's where we welcome in our fifth graders and our parents just to meet their teachers for the upcoming academic year. Our open house dates have been set. So on Tuesday, September 20th, grades five and eight will have open house. And on Thursday, September 22nd, it will be sixth and seventh grade. I'll send out more details on those events and times. One of the things we'll do is we'll have conversations to explain how we're gonna report progress as well as communicate with families for the upcoming year and we'll do that by grade level right in this space with families. So I'm looking forward to that and how could I um, not miss our grand opening next week, August 23rd. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. It's gonna be a special day for sure and from 11 to one o'clock we'll have, uh, again, that all-star band and music performances right here but we'll start right outside with uh, words from Dr. Morris and Michael and it's gonna be a very, very special day. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, Rebecca Noe, principal at the middle, or at the high school, not the middle school. Um, so for tonight, I'm actually only going to have one announcement because our student rep is here, Paige, and we were able to meet earlier today, and she's going to take care of the rest of them. Um, but today, we had all of our new teachers in the district, and so it was fun to be able to meet all of them, greet them, see them start off on all of the new teacher workshop things that they are going to cover, and invite them over to the high school for half the day. So we got to meet, really describe what the high school's like, what the culture's like, what they can expect, let them ask questions, explore the building. Um, so that's the beginning today and two more days next week for new teachers. Um, so that was just something that was going on and then Paige will cover the rest. Any questions? Oh, sure. Um, for construction, the nurse's suite is almost finished. Um, there's a couple of little things that have to happen, but they've been moving furniture in that's almost ready to go. Um, where the nurse's suite was, we've turned into a small conference room and then a place where teachers can actually come have lunch, and our secretaries now have a place to have lunch. They actually didn't have a place to have lunch before, so they would sit in the ISS booths. They no longer have to be in ISS to have lunch. Um, what else do we have going on? We have a new security being installed for the admin suite part of the building, so a reader card so the IDs to get through that second door, so a little more security there. Um, the new conference room on the NPR stage, our wall, I don't think it's here yet, but it's supposed to be arriving this week. So it's actually a huge foldable wall that you can pull out on the stage. It has a whiteboard on it. It is to be soundproof, and it'll be a very large meeting room that's up there, but we can also open that up. So if it needs to be used as a stage, we'll be able to do that too. Um, we have the same flexible furniture the SAU has, so the tables and chairs can actually move in different configurations. Um, and then we'll have a um, portable projector that we're able to use in that room. So for example, a small class could use it all. So I think that's all of the projects we have going on. Okay, you're welcome. Air conditioners? Um, there are three units that won't be installed until the middle of September because they're waiting on parts, but those are the only three that we don't have. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, still paused. We're just waiting for materials. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I was overzealous to dive into my handbook changes, but that's later in the agenda, so that's why I stood up and sat down. Um, I have no new construction, although we do have a little mini project where we have opened a wall between our tech lab and our library, and we waited for a while to have those doors put up, and they are up, so that's our mini little construction project. Today was a terrific day with new teachers. We have four new fantastic teachers joining us at Massway School, and they were able to spend the afternoon with me, touring the school, talking about the master schedule, spending time in their classrooms, and I'm really excited about our four new teachers. Safety, a lot's gone on with safety, um, and we'll continue to. I have a meeting with Chief Dronsfeld on Friday. We have scheduled quarterly safety committee meetings, and that's been past practice for Massway School with the fire chief, police chief. I feel very blessed in Lee. They work very closely with us. They are on site regularly for drop-off, pick-up. They pop into lunch just to chat with kids. They're just a very positive, presence on a very normal basis, which is great. Um, we do have a new camera software that Mr. Goldsmith and I were able to be um, taught a little bit more about by our IT department. I also walked the perimeter of the building with our new facilities director, and we're looking at our cameras and ways that we can improve our cameras. So we've tried to look at surveillance and um, trying to think of the big overarching access control, things of that nature to be sure that we're prepared for a safe school year. And again, I feel like we're very safe in Lee and I feel fortunate for the emergency services that are in town and just the way they partner with us on the regular. And I will wait on the handbook. I'll be back. Thank you. Catherine Flora, Director of Student Services. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit first about our summer program that we held here at the middle school. It was very successful. I just want to thank Jay and Bill for rolling out the red carpet for the entire district. Um, we had all students K through 12, preschool was still at the high school, um, who attended our summer program, whether it was for special education or remediation. Um, the high school joined us for their credit recovery. So it really was a great place to have it. Um, it was nice to not deal with very hot temps. 
um, and for kids to be learning in an environment that was really much more conducive to learning. Um, all the staff that worked were pretty excited to be here and uh, kids had a good time. So next summer, uh, we'll look forward to doing that again and then we'll have access to field space and the playground so it's gonna be even better. Um, the other quick update is that we still do have um, about 10 to 12 openings for paraeducators um, across the district. We are in better shape than we were last year um, going into this week. Uh, but we do, you know, we've had some move-ins um, certainly, and then um, we're still trying to hire um, it's about six at the high school, and then across the district we have the other four. And I say 12 because we're still trying to figure out support for some other students um, who have moved in. So, so we are actively interviewing. As soon as somebody applies, we get them in the next day. Um, we have had people ghost us in terms of accept a job and not show up. Um, we've had several of those again this summer, um, and we've had people not show for interviews. So we definitely are, uh, Andrea, Brian, Melissa, and Brittany um, have all been working hard on that hiring process, and uh, they put a lot of hours into it. Um, the last update is that um, there has been a small change in the administrative structure because Andrea Beniskevich has left the district. She was offered an opportunity right in her hometown in Marshwood and Elliot, so she has accepted a position there. So um, Brian will still be continuing at Moharmet. Uh, Brittany Prendergast will continue at the middle school as planned, Melissa Jean at the high school, and I'll be covering Massway. And Lori attempt? Grant, of course, continues oh, in preschool. Brian. Uh, as far as the prior professionals go, any, if anybody's interested, just put it out publicly, the state is putting on free training uh, certifications for paraprofessionals. Yeah, so we didn't get that. That that was a that was publicized after the fact. So the training part, in all honesty, the training part we can manage. It's getting the people in the door to then train them. So um, we do not have requirements for certification for paraeducators because we are not a Title I district. So there are some districts who have that difficulty where they have to have the certification because of Title I rules. We do not have that. So I think it could help some of those districts, although they, they weren't, all of them weren't really aware of the training happening. So I'm not sure of... Um, you know, how many people attended that, if it was well attended or not, but it was something I think could be repeated if we could push it out to our communities. Um, but again, we do a lot of our in-house training. We have a lot of specialists and experts we bring in to work with our paras, uh, a lot of job embedded PD, but we don't have to have the certification that's required. Brian, we didn't get that notice until two days before the training. Did you get it earlier? Um, actually, I read about it online. That's where we read about it. So the DOE did not. It did not get sent to us. No. I saw it on like a Facebook page, no. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Could you give the 10 second elevator pitch in terms of hours or range of hours and starting rate? For a paraeducator, sure. So the paraeducator contract was um, renegotiated, and it's actually it, it's a great contract. So um, paraeducators are coming in um, closer to 15, all the way up through 18 um, an hour. But you can earn additional 50 cents for an associate's degree in a related field to education, or a dollar in a related field um, to education. In addition, if you're working um, with a student who um, we do deem um, requires additional personal care or need, there's an additional $2 built in for that. So you could come in with no experience and be making kind of top of the scale or some experience and be above that. The hours pretty much are about six and a half to seven a day. Majority of people are at six and a half a day. So it really is pretty much school hours. Um, but we've been flexible and been able to piecemeal some part-time positions when we've needed to. Um, we're definitely still seeking people and pushing that out. And again, and anyone who's interested or wants more information can certainly call our SAU office. There's educational incentives too, isn't there for? Yes, powers. they can take courses, Granite State College, so we have some educational incentives. Mm -hmm. The healthcare package is great. It really is a great package. Some of the people who decline are looking for more money. Um, they're looking for more of that hourly rate and they may not need the insurance sometimes. They might be under the parents' health insurance, so they're not looking for that benefit. Um, but we're definitely doing better with the new negotiated contract that was 
that was put forth. And um, the districts, some of the districts that were offering more money the past couple of years can no longer offer that because they used some ESSER funds to do so. Um, and those, that money's gone, so they're not able to kind of compete with us in that way that they were. Do, do you expect the situation where you are directly covering Mastway to continue for the entire school year, or is that a temporary situation? Yes. <laughs> I do. I, it's hard to find a part-time position right now. We'll continue to um, look and seek. I think my concern is, you know, we want to bring somebody in who has a certification or is eligible for certification, and we just don't have that right now. So I'm really excited to get back into a building a little bit, actually. Um, I think it'd be good for me, and I think it would be um, great to just be in and work with Misty. Misty and I work together in special education, so um, I also have some help over there with Felicia Sperry, who's a school psychologist. She actually helped a lot before we had Brian, um, so we've talked with her about pitching in a little bit as well. So um, Misty and I are going to meet and just kind of outline what I'm going to cover um, and then, you know, what she plans to oversee, but I, I think it'll be fine. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Uh, announcements, accommodations, and comments from the board? All right, then we will move on to district reports. So assistant superintendent. Good evening. As Misty said, um, the principals will be coming up to talk about the changes to their handbook. But before we get to that, there are a few things I'd like to just mention. One is about our summer program for REACH. That program completed. It was a wonderful success. We had about 100 kids a week participate. Um, they had access to free breakfast and lunch. Um, and then they had the afternoon program with the Durham Parks and Rec. I just want to thank the town of Lee. Um, Durham Parks and Rec and Rachel specifically, Gazowski, and also Misty um, for a wonderful summer program and we're really excited. We tr For next year, we tried to expand some of the offerings for the older students, so we had a theater program and a, and a writing program included this year and we're looking to expand some of those options for the older students next year as well to continue to do that. So we're really excited about that. Um, we did have some new faculty events today. We had had um, approximately 15 new faculty members and staff members come today to receive their computers and to talk to them. We had Teresa come and talk about HR and some of the process behind HR. We also had some, um, Josh came with um, members of the um, information technology department to talk about different aspects that would they would be connected with them. Um, we had principals come and take the new faculty and staff to the building to be able to, their individual buildings to be able to give them tours and talk to them. And the new faculty and um, will come back on the 24th and the 25th of August. On the 24th, they will have very specific trainings related to curriculum um, and also um, instruction and assessment at the building level. So they'll get training on MTSS, they'll get training on things like open circle and foundations literacy, um, Eureka math, what, whatever the areas that they'll need. Uh, and then on the 25th, they'll come back and our technology integrators will work with them to get them set up in PowerSchool and Schoology and do some training around some of the different digital platforms we also have at the district. So we're doing a lot more training with faculty as they come in and some of some of those opportunities um, we're hoping to, are going to be led by faculty that are here at the building, um, at each building. So we're excited about that as well. And we also have trainings, additional trainings going on throughout the district. So along with the faculty trainings, every year we also have trainings that we do with um, members of of the staff, so the SAU staff, uh, child nutrition, IT, transportation, um, all, all the different staff, they participate in trainings related to Title IX, 
They also participate in the same trainings to for suicide prevention um, and things like her, uh, sexual harassment as well as um, other safety related um, areas like bullying, how to identify bullying, where to go if you see it. Because a lot of the staff work directly with the students, so bus drivers will receive the same training um, and, and um, cafeteria workers will receive that training also. So that will also be happening on the 25th. There's a lot going on on the 25th. I think that's when Becca has some things going on at the high school on the 25th also. So there'll be a lot happening that day. I don't know if anyone has any questions about any of that before we move on. Great, so what I'm going to do, I, I know that you all have the handbooks you've, um, and, some, and the summary of changes, so what I'd like to do is start with the elementary school and if David and Misty wanna come up and talk a little bit about the summary of changes and answer any questions you may have. Good evening again. Um, the, the majority of the changes that were made to the K-4 handbooks are similar, uh, and so we can share those, and then uh, if there are any differences between the two schools, we can highlight those as well. Yep. Um, the majority of our changes, well, were in two categories. One was just basic procedures in the school that have to change as they do when our start and end times change, things like that. Um, at Moharamit, our pickup and drop-off uh, procedures are changing dr dramatically compared to the past two years because we're going back to the pre-COVID pickup and drop-off routines that we had. Um, and so I, I've been communicating a lot with families and really trying to push getting back to the bus ridership that we had uh, prior to COVID, which was 80 to 85% of our students on the school buses, which allowed for our drop-off and pickup procedures that had been happening for quite a while at Moharamit. We do have one little change in that, which is that uh, prior to the construction of the vestibule, pickup was always inside the building from the bear all the way to the cafeteria, and it was really just open door and people would come in, um, which is a really lovely community experience, but we know uh, in this day and age, not uh, safe and, and not something that we have good control over. So we actually get to use our vestibule for one of its intended purposes now, and so we'll be doing pickup um, at the front doors of the school. The students will be in the building, and the parents will be outside underneath our pyramid atrium, uh, protected from the elements, and we'll reunite them with their children that way um, so we can still keep our doors safely secured. Um, those were sort of the basic ones. And, th and then the big changes in our handbooks had to do with the restorative practices that we're working on K-12. Um, and for us, through our codes of conduct, conduct and through some of the paragraphs on bus discipline and issues like that, we added language around, for the bus uh, conduct, it was really language that was describing what we already do, which is how Misty and I work with students and go through a restorative practice to help them problem solve issues on the bus, um, apologize when appropriate, make amends when appropriate, go through those kinds of steps before there's um, an automatic black and white type of discipline uh, to a bus issue. Um, and so we added language around that, and then we added the uh, which is consistent in all of the handbooks, uh, an opening statement about uh, the Oyster River uh, uh, restorative practices before we got into our codes of conduct. I just wanna add for Mastway, um, parent pickup and drop off will be the same as it has been the last couple of years. It works out well for Mastway and our neighbors at the Lee Congre uh, Congregational Church, excuse me, um, they're just great neighbors and they've been terrific to work with us. Sue Caswell um, has been helpful in making sure that we partner with them appropriately in order to use their driveway, keep um, Mast Road clear, so we actually are, it's, to be honest, it's one of our silver linings that came out of the pandemic, the way that we're doing drop off and pick up with parents, and it is something we'd like to continue with. So our facility just allows for that, um, and we will continue that way. Misty, did you, do you have a formal agreement with the church at this point? 
We did. Sue helped me um, develop an agreement and give um, proof of insurance and that sort of thing. Our facilities director was involved also, as Jim was in the past, and we, um, you know, agreed to plow for them and grade a uh, great. I don't right. know the proper way with the gravel to be sure that the extra usage of their um, driveway is something that we help maintenance. Heather, I just wanted to say thank you. I saw that email late before I came in tonight, and I appreciated the feedback on the handbook. And that's Maybe something we can look one. at. Huh? Maybe the only one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Jay Richard again, principal at the middle school. Uh, just kind of like David and Misty said, you know, a lot of it's changing times. For example, 7.50 a.m., that's the time when students are allowed into the building. And in our conversations with, again, Durham safety personnel, fire and police, the doors are not going to be open until 7.50 because that's when we have appropriate supervision. We do not want to have the doors open so anybody could just kind of walk into the school early in the morning. Uh, some of the practices as well, and I looked at this handbook for quite some time, is just it's changing your mindset instead of focusing on consequences and when you look at it, a restorative approach, when a kid makes a poor choice or makes a mistake, it's about helping that child learn from that mistake and grow and move forward. Uh, it's not about consequences. I have a SEL, social emotional learning PLC that's been working over the summer to kind of look at our approaches here across the school in terms of student expectations and following restorative practices. They're actually meeting today. They wrap up tomorrow, uh, three days, and it's just very impressive about changing our mindsets here at school in terms of helping kids, helping them learn, helping them grow, and not focusing on if student does X, this is what happens. We've also looked at We've actually made changes even prior to this in terms of, um, I can recall offenses where we would suspend a student out of school, where we work with families to make sure that, again, that child's learning and limiting out of school suspensions. I actually can't recall any last year where we keep the kids inside school uh, unless it's you know, a significant offense where we want to work with families and work with them in school so they have access to services and most importantly, school counselors. I did see your notes, Heather, thank you very much. And uh, that's something we're gonna work on. Collabority as a principal team looking at each other's handbooks. Uh, we worked on the restored to police but, uh, practice but make sure that they're common across the entire district. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Jay, just a point that you didn't include in your work and Suzanne didn't, is the amount of work that you and Suzanne and teachers in this building did this summer to prepare for um, a common approach to uh, reporting student progress and we'll have that presentation in early October for the board. Yes, we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Question yes. for, I saw the, um, your bullet on all staff and their contact information have been updated, which is great. I'm wondering for, the. Um, for each of the levels about the websites um, and whether staff information and team information, you don't have to answer it right, right now, but yep. is, is, that, um, is that in the works also? That's a great question, Yusi. Yes, that's in process as we speak. For example, I mentioned the supplies earlier. That's something that was updated this week and we still have some work to do in terms of the staff pages, uh, what staff, counseling, who do, who's doing what grade level, et cetera. So my plan is to have that fully up to date for the start of school. So, thank you. Thank Wait, you. hang on. Oh, I'm I sorry. I give everybody a chance. Oh. One thing that I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but um, a section on suicide prevention or suicide resources within the counseling group, particularly at the middle school and high school mm -hmm. in the handbook, maybe that would be an addition that would be helpful for people. That's great feedback, yes. Thank you. Um, Heather, in early September, we'll be doing a report on the youth risk survey um, that actually complements your question. And September is Suicide Prevention Month, and our counselors are already gearing up to make sure that that's a pervasive topic. One of the changes, too, is all uh, student 
ID cards will have information that's appropriate by grade level for that, and that's a new state law, too. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again. Um, some of the same changes with the schedule being tweaked this year, and I think we're going over that a little bit later in Dr. Morse's um, section. And so really it's, um, it's more um, the restorative practices, and what that is about is changing behavior. And so I thought I would give you an example of something we actually, actually implemented last year. So historically, when students are found vaping in the school, they're suspended for five to 10 days. And they're, so they're out of the school, they're at home, probably vaping. And so one of the things that we did last year is change that. And so what they end up doing is they, we catch them, they come to the office, we call the parents, they would go home for that day, but the next morning they come in with their parents and we do a reentry meeting. And at that point, the parents have had a chance to talk to their student, understand the circumstances. They had a brief conversation with us, basically what happened. But then we talk about now how can we move forward? And so that reentry meeting is really more restorative. Um, but then they sign a contract. And so the assistant principals sit with the family and and as a unit, all three parties, the student, the parents, and the assistant principal, come up with dates for certain things. So some of those things are, for example, an educational piece. Um, so either we would have Breathe New Hampshire come in periodically and do a presentation, and those students were required to go, um, or Officer Nicolosi would sit with them if we couldn't do the Breathe New Hampshire, and he had his own PowerPoint that he would do and go over with them. So the edu educational piece was happening. Um, they had to do community service. And there are a couple of reasons behind that, but one of the main ones it was a way for them to get out into the community and find something they were interested in and become part of that community. And it might be something they then carried forward. Um, another piece to that was they had to do a reflection at the end um, and they had to meet with our LADAC two to three times. We don't talk to the LADAC. All the LADAC tells us is that yes, we met. Um, the student and the LADAC decide if they're going to continue meeting or not. That's between them. But they, we just need to know they met the requirements. And so between all those things, they then reflect. And so when I used to sit down and do this with students, a lot of times it was, uh, I'm never gonna do this again, and, and this is this maybe something I learned. But I really talked to them about, what did you think about the process? What did you really get out of this? Is this something that is going to help you stop vaping or move you in that direction? And so it's a real conversation and dialogue, not a, okay, check mark, you wrote something that sounds reflective. So I really, I dug a little bit deeper when I would have those conversations. So it's an example of something that we've moved towards. So kids are in the building, they're in school, they're staying with their teachers, they're still in the community and with their friends. They're not, they don't have out of school suspension. And so as an example, that's one thing. Um, other restorative practices could be mediation. It could be a restorative circle. Um, it could be meeting with the assistant principal and figuring out how they're gonna go back into the classroom and talk to the teacher about whatever the reason was that they were sent out for that afternoon. Um, so those are just areas that we're looking at as we move forward, an important piece that students always know they have due process. So there's always a point where we listen to their side of a story. It's never assumed a student did something wrong because there's always a different perspective. And so sometimes there won't be a consequence or a restorative practice that we have to follow. Um, maybe there's a conversation with a teacher about about why something happened and maybe different ways to approach students in the future. Um, so that's, that's a major area where there have been some changes that I wanted to cover. I think most of the other areas of the changes were tweaks, flex time being updated or schedules being updated. But did you have any questions on this? Um, just, and, and I know that the schedules are also coming up, so it probably will come in there. But I noticed that on the blue white days, it doesn't say like, a, which A, B, C, you know, yep. which, right. yeah. So. so it's gonna be blue day, block one, two, three, four, or white day, block one, two, three, four. So blue day, block one, I might have math, so I'm gonna go to algebra every day, blue day, block one. Right. White day, block one, maybe I have my English class, essentials. Okay. So every day, white day, block one, so I go to essentials. So it's not gonna be considered like an A, B, C. No, so we won't have the alphabet exactly. going back and yeah, forth. Couple reasons for this. One of the major reasons we found was on the back end of Power School, it actually allowed scheduling in Power School to be easier, so more kids got into more classes that they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, when they had to do it with letters before, the way they actually had to maneuver Power School made it more difficult for that to happen. So making this switch to just numbers and them being in the chronological order made that easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And, and then my, and the only, and this is for all, it just I really appreciated, you know, the work that goes into the handbooks and I really liked having uh, both the summary as well as the actual handbook. So thanks to everyone for Absolutely. that work. Okay, 
Thank you very much. All right, Dr. Morse. I want to repeat what Jay said um, next Tuesday, the 23rd. We're doing the dedication of this beautiful new facility. It starts at um, 11 and will end at 1. And we're going to end in this room with um, music. So how appropriate, right? So I'm, I'm looking forward to the day as Jay is. Uh, one of the themes that you heard from the principals uh, in every single one of them was uh, you've been hearing safety themes. And it's no coincidence that the extra emphasis we've been putting on safety is a direct result of um, the school shooting in Texas. And we got a report uh, that summarized uh, a number of the failings uh, that happened in that particular school shooting, and one of them was very simple. Uh, doors weren't locked. And so um, all the principals and the Lee chief and the um, Madbury chief have, uh, and our facilities director has walked uh, the buildings. Uh, Misty and David gave very specific needs related to making sure that doors were locked, meaning that locks needed to be installed. All of that is happening before we open school. Um, we've done a quick review today uh, with, um, with uh, Mike Nicolosi, our SRO and, and Jay. And we're actually going to adopt a lot of the practices that we designed specifically into this building into all four buildings, which is um, having a primary entrance into the building and uh, making sure that people are uh, buzzed in. And, um, you know, as we did this, uh, small things show up, but small things matter at this point. In addition, the state has added uh, about uh, six new criteria that they want us to add to our emergency plan. And so we're in the process of working with Mike and, and doing that. I also want to say that the conversations that we've been having with the police chiefs related to um, access to our cameras should our students or staff uh, be threatened has actually opened up a broader conversation around um, school safety I met with. Um, the Lee Chief and the Durham Chief uh, Deputy today, along with our SRO uh, and Josh and the Stratford County um, Dispatch. And you know, the conversation actually um, was really engaging and kind of far reaching beyond the conversation of cameras. And so that was really exciting in terms of how open everybody has been to these conversations. And this afternoon I had a conversation with the Madbury chief and um, he was pretty um, charged about the work we're doing. So he's pretty excited. Um, tomorrow or on Friday I'll have a conversation with Chief Dean at, the, at UNH. So there's another avenue that um, we hadn't initially uh, thought through, and um, uh, Chief McGann actually opened that door for me today. So uh, we sent a, we tried calling Chief Dean, but uh, he wasn't available. So we sent him an email saying we'd like to to, to continue the conversation with him as well. So school safety has been on the front burner. Um, I think the gun presentation by the parents' gun safety is really, you know, timely given the, the law in New Hampshire where um, people can open carry or conceal carry on public school property. To me, that's just insane, but that's the law in New Hampshire. <clears throat> and so I want to continue that conversation with our chiefs um, in terms of, you know, how we might um, interact with them because the law is crystal clear, people have the right, um, but we also don't want people feeling threatened in the schoolhouse. So there's some, some work there. I'd like to bring in Attorney uh, Glenn and into that conversation with the chiefs and our um, principals. Uh, it became a pretty, um, I would say, intense a conversation that we had yesterday in our opening of school um, meeting with with administrators. So school safety is is um, paramount on our minds because of the incident, and this has happened every time there's been a school shooting. People interest rises, and so I want to take advantage of the interest right now, and you know make sure that um, we 
can in, continue to improve our school safety practices. So just in terms of reminding everybody, we're required to have an emergency plan submitted to Homeland Security in New Hampshire. Typically, it's in the first week of September. That's been extended because of the new requirements on the law to October. Um, and the principals have been very faithful in having their emergency plans reviewed by uh, the chiefs and the two smaller towns and by our SRO here in Durham. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the most wonderful pieces of um, outcome uh, from all these conversations is that we use ALICE training here in Durham and uh, the Lee Police Department also uses ALICE training but they lost their officers who are certified to train. So I asked um, the chief today would it be okay if the SRO from Durham went over and did the training um, in, in Lee, and he said absolutely. So we're beginning to see some um, breaking down of the traditional um, barriers, and so my conversation today with Chief McGeehan, I asked him the same question, and he said absolutely. So um, I think these conversations that we opened up this summer are bearing more fruit than we um, we had as an outcome. So it's, um, it, it's been very encouraging and rewarding. Uh, David has a great relationship with Chief McGeehan. Um, Misty has a great relationship with her chief. And of course, um, you know, the Durham Department from patrolman to chief has always been here for these two schools. So I think the relationships actually have, uh, as good as they have been, have improved immeasurably um, as a result of this one conversation that we opened up about um, school safety with, with the chiefs. So that, that's why you heard a lot of safety in their reports because we've been talking a lot about it. Um, buses, uh, question you got- about safety? Uh, sure, go um, ahead. Quick question. Uh, so as, as a parent, I'm sure speaking for all parents, the, um, the work that you're doing in this area is, is fantastic. I wanted to ask about teachers and just how um, rattling um, this must be for, mm -hmm. for teachers and, and staff. Yeah. And wondering, in addition to the sort of logistical training that I'm sure we're providing, uh, is there a, a, a place for them to be sort of talking about these concerns and feeling the support of administration? Absolutely. Teachers have very open conversations with the principals. Um, Jay had an active group um, last spring. The ALICE training that we're talking about is initially 45 minutes, but then the next one is four hours, and we're going to provide that across the district. And the, uh, the idea, uh, and, and then Mike Nic uh, Nicolosi can have that open conversation. Um, there's a lot of fear uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, I think that the open carry concealed weapon law creates fear in public schools. Um, and I'm not talking against the Second Amendment, I'm just talking about if the university can be gun free, why can't public schools be gun, gun free? And um, you know, that's, that's the conversation that's happened in Concord time and time again and got no traction. So the parent initiative tonight about gun safety just makes a lot of sense to me and I think complements our work around um, emergency safety plans. So yes, the, answer, the short answer is yes, absolutely, you see. Um, moving on to our staffing, uh, you have got some piece of that from Catherine. Uh, actually, we've done really well in uh, the area of professionals. So teachers in administrative positions, we have been you know, really uh, blessed. Uh, sadly, our blessing is another system's curse because what's typically happening is we're getting applications from teachers in late July and August from other school systems as we have late openings. And just so you all know, um, we talk to we talk system to system, and you know if the situation uh, is a late um, opening and the applicant is somebody that the principal wants me to hire, I call that superintendent. So uh, it's very possible when we have an opening this late, for example, um, uh, we had a very late resignation of an art teacher. Uh, we have, uh, as of yesterday, seven applications for that position, so it's not an, an issue of are we getting the applicants, it's the issue of working with uh, potentially working with a district that already has that person employed in, in negotiating exit strategies. Um, so it would, 
really be unprofessional for us, for example, to bring a teacher in for an interview, offer them the job, and tell them just walk out of the other system and come to us. So we, we, we don't do it that way. We're very cognizant of how all this plays out in August. So it could be, and you know, for example, if we use the art teacher, if we have that interview, and, I, and, and know he's doing those interviews this week, um, it could be that we would not have that art teacher in September because that teacher needs to give their current employer you know, some sort of notice so they have a chance to fill that position. So you know, it, it could be very cutthroaty, um, but it's not. We try to be very respectful of, of our, our, our colleagues and our fellow school systems, and um, so that's going on. Uh, we hired for we did hire somebody from Epping, and you know I talked to the superintendent, and he's going to release this person as soon as he possibly can, meaning he's advertised and and so forth. So in the beginning weeks, uh, in some places in the district, the teacher who we've hired may be filling an obligation in the system that we hired them from, uh, but that will normally turn over relatively fast. So staffing for professionals, we're in, we're in really good shape. Uh, bus drivers, we um, were at 26 drivers. Unfortunately, one of those drivers is going right in for an operation. And so we'll be at 25 as we open the year. Um, we have two drivers who are being trained. Those two drivers will be here um, on board in October. And I did authorize um, Lisa and Sue to hire two spare drivers because we constantly are in that situation where we have just what we need and then we lose somebody. So we need to build in some kind of capacity to, to cover that and so um, Sue and Lisa are on board with that. And uh, just in terms of the new practice related to my not putting coaches in front of you for approval in your packet for information only is the list of coaches that have been approved by me uh, at the request of Andy. So that's that. Question, Jim? Yes, sir. Um, you had mentioned teachers that are leaving other districts late to come here, but that means we've had resignations from here that are late. Exactly. Yeah, the art if, teacher, for example, if, was last week. So if, in, uh, it, for us to have seven applications in one week is kind of a miracle. But my question is, what if they had already signed a contract for this year and they put in a, and they resign? Do we hold them to that? What's, what's the teeth in that contract to? This you know? late in the year, I would hold somebody while we advertised and I would hold them to a 30-day kind of thing, but there's nothing in our contract. We do not have governing language with the guild that dictates that. It's mostly that we do it as a uh, gentleman's agreement, and so far it's worked out great. Nobody's left us holding the bag, um, so we, we've been pretty good. Uh, if, it's, if we know we're going to have enough applications, then I'll release them right away. I didn't know about the art position this late, but so that's good news. Um, but if it say it was a primary position, we would have applications. Like Pretty Catherine, you may need to teach art half time. What's that? Like Catherine, you may need to teach art oh, half time. Yeah. That would be fun. <laughs> that means I wouldn't have to do other parts of my job, right? <laughs> no, that's not how that works. I would love to do that. The good old days, you'll see. Um, just want to check my list here. Um, enrollment across the district is really as we thought it would be in uh, spring, so we haven't had any surprises. Uh, David and Misty are now at that point in kindergarten and fourth grade, where the, the people who enroll at this point would need to go to the other school, so they have it figured out. Um, doesn't mean it's uncomfortable for the parent, because you could have well, David actually did this, and he called me and overruled what we normally do. He had a, a family move in, you know, virtually across the street from the, from the Moharamet School, and um, he decided, or he called me and said, do you mind if I hang on to this kid, even if it exceeds our class size, because it really doesn't make any sense to send, you know, this little one across the district. And so, even though we have that arrangement with Ms. D and David, they both are very sensitive. Uh, people to the needs of families and, and try to accommodate, but at some point, um, 
their hearts and their brains got to disconnect because we can't overload one school at the expense of the other. So I think that uh, Missy and David had a fantastic job working together and balancing the needs of the two schools. So I just want to give them credit for that. Uh, the middle school is opening at numbers that are very manageable, and the high school is as well. So we're in pretty good shape in terms of enrollment. Question. Yes. Just, I, just noticing that kindergarten is maxed out at both schools at this point, it, you know. So presumably, you would keep since they're both at. Yeah, if they're if they're both in a situation, whether it's kindergarten or fourth grade, and it doesn't make any sense to send a kid across the district if they're both maxed out in that grade, so they hang on to them. Yes. Thank you, Denise. And I did want to um, share a COVID update, so I'm going to ask Catherine to come up. Come up. Uh, pretty dramatic changes last week from the CDC, and so we're updating our, our practices, and Catherine will speak to that. So I gave you each a quick handout that we'll be sending out. Uh, Dr. Morse will be sending out in his upcoming newsletter. We'll be posting it on the website. Also, the nurses will review this again next week. If we make any minor tweaks or adjust adjustments, we'll, we'll get that to you. Um, but basically, as you may have heard, big changes. The biggest change with the CDC re CDC's recommendations, <coughs> and by the way, New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services just gave us a link to CDC, so they didn't publish anything different. They just <coughs> have a link that says go here. Um, so they are also supporting these recommendations. But the biggest guidance that's changed is um, you no longer have to quarantine if you are unvaccinated and exposed to a presumed or positive contact. So what that does is it eliminates um, those who are unvaccinated missing, um, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 days because of being exposed or living in a household with a positive contact. So um, we're continuing to focus on our hand um, hygiene routine. So again, with good hand washing techniques, um, PRL, those kinds of things, um, the nurses will talk with the teachers about you know important times of the day. Um, elementary school already does this, but continue to talk about it with our, our adolescents before and after eating, after using restrooms, recess, things like that. Um, we're continuing with our enhanced cleaning and disinfecting protocols for all the school facilities and school buses. Um, this is good for all um, of viruses and kind of infections that we come across. We did see less of other things as well. So we're hoping continuing with it, the cleaning protocols will also help fight strep and those kinds of things. Um, we have a great air handling and ventilation um, practices that were put in place with Jim Rizicki and his team. We're continuing with that um, maximum exchange as needed. And um, you know, if they're, the weather is great, having windows down on the buses and things like that, we'll continue to do to have outside air in as much as possible. Um, continuing with your sick, stay home. So the golden rule of you don't feel well, you have symptoms, we're asking you to stay home um, and contact your school nurse. And then the other big mitigation, obviously, is that you isolate if you're positive. Um, so the way that this works, you can see the little, little chart there, whether they have symptoms or not, it just helps families to understand the difference. But ultimately, whether you test positive or wherever your day zero is, so if you have symptoms and your day zero is Sunday, um, the nurse will work with you on what your day five is. When you return, it is, um, a mask wearing situation from day six through day 10. That continues, that's the CDC stands firmly behind that. Um, because you essentially are coming back after day five, nine times out of 10, still positive. So um, mask wearing inside. And then um, if you had no symptoms, it just gives people kind of a guideline. Sometimes people test for another reason and they find out they're positive, so it gives them a guideline for that. Again, the easiest way to work through this is for families to contact the school nurse and work through their days with them. The school nurse does assign the days, so it's not a parent chosen uh, timeline. Um, so it's really important that as soon as they get a positive test, they take a picture of that um, or contact the school nurse to figure those days out and not wait. Um, we're no longer, as I discussed, we're no longer using the quarantine model. Um, and 
The other big piece that we talked about in the spring is we no longer have the SAS testing, so we're not doing asymptomatic testing um, or symptomatic testing. Of course, if a family's in a bind, they'll contact the school nurse and figure something out. Um, so we still do have uh, some Binax tests left, um, and if we can gain access to more, we'll continue to do that. Um, but really, we're trying to push um, families into seeking health care and going through their health care providers and making sure that um, they're connecting with them as well. But as always, the school nurses will send out a newsletter and update families from a more personal stance, and they'll give parents tips about um, how to contact them and, and um, things that they should do, as well as if they're in a bind, you know, how to go about getting a test. Um, they'll help them with that. So, you know, the social distancing is gone. Um, our, our cafeterias are gonna be back to normal. The schedules are back to supporting more of a normal routine. Um, snacks are gonna be allowed in the classrooms and uh, that will reduce the amount of transitions. Uh, when you really reflect on a lot of behavioral issues that we have or um, you know, downtime where shenanigans happen, it's during transition time and we certainly had a lot of transition times for kids walking back and forth for different reasons. So it's, it's you know, stop teaching, go have your snack, come back, regain their attention. It's just, it's missed opportunities during the day for teachers to have in their classroom. Yeah. We know that um, you know, masking is still effective when a person is, uh, is contagious and if, if they can wear a, a tight fitting mask that is more effective than, for example, someone wearing a mask to um, uh, to protect themselves. If, if it can be, um, if if we can have a, a well-fitting mask on a person who's infected, that makes a big difference. Um, would it be? What would you think of the the district offering? Um, uh, no N95 or other tight fitting masks, since I know many families might just have surgical masks or cloth masks lying around, um, whereas their child might be open to wearing a um, another mask or you know not they could it would be voluntary should they choose to take one. So we have plenty of um, KN95. Should staff and faculty. Um, need those, what I can tell you is kids will not keep them on. Um, they're really tight and they're pretty uncomfortable. Uh, we do have plenty of the surgical masks that we have bought. We have pediatric ones as well. And the, I was just actually at the pediatrician's office and they said they continue to recommend these for kids. Um, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's better coverage than a cloth mask, of course. It's not an N95, but it still gives them good coverage. Um, so we have plenty of masks still. At the end of the year, um, we picked up I think I requested like four or six thousand. I can't remember, but I pick we picked those up at the end of the year. Um, so we have a bunch of those to start, and we do have a lot of kids who wear the KF masks, which are a little bit, a um, little bit more tolerable. Um, but really, mask choice, you know, with families, it really depends on what's tolerable for the kid. But we do offer we we have some from the state. If adolescents wanted them, the KNs are kind of big; they wouldn't fit a youth face. Um, but we have plenty of pediatric surgical ones. And I still do have a stock of clear masks for our speech pathologists to be using as needed when they're working on um, articulation therapy. Yeah. Two, two little things. One is you, you talked about uh, availability or accessibility of, um, of tests at home, and it may be helpful to remind families that if they have health insurance with prescription coverage. Yes. Tests are generally available at no cost, uh, no, no copay or deductible. Every insurer has a different way of doing that. So, yeah, yeah, we uh, can have the nurses put that in their update as yeah. well. And then um, on the on the uh, the guidelines that you gave us in hard copy just before the meeting, um, up in the bullet point section, it says that that. Uh, you may only return to school on day six if symptoms have improved and you are fever free for 24 hours. Yes. And it does not say that on the table at the bottom, which is the yep. part I read first because. It's a table. Well, yep, it, I can add because that. Because it's a table. Yep. So, so yep. I think that's a very important point that needs to be in both places. Yeah, we can put it down there. Yeah, and that is a really important point. So you don't automatically come back on day six. Your symptoms have to have improved and you do need to be fever free. You have to be fever free no matter what if you have strep or something else for 24 hours before you return. 
Um, so the nurses actually talked about putting that in the newsletter in general. We need all of that to be followed because we have kids who come back within vomiting within an hour and they're, they get sent to school that day and then they really do have a stomach bug. Um, so they're gonna be focusing on a lot of that as well. I was just going to add to your to your point that the there are also the free tests if people haven't already ordered twice it's eight tests each order and household can order two so that essentially is 16 yeah. tests through cdc.gov yeah um, if people haven't already accessed those as well and they still have them I actually just got a bunch so okay we'll make sure and include that link again too and we d still do have um, some kits that had two in them that were given to us by UNH. They expire at the end of September, so we're going to be actually pushing those out right away at the beginning of the year from the nurses' offices um, so that they get sent home with families. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Catherine. Okay, thanks. And then um, the last thing on my list was just a quick review from the middle school and high school. Uh, they did a, a fairly comprehensive uh, report last spring related to the work that uh, uh, Principal Noe and Richard did related to their master schedule. So I'll ask you guys to come up to the podium. Uh, the goal was to create a synergy between the two master schedules that allowed um, staff and students to move between the buildings. And of course, that's historically what we have done but it's always been at a cost because the two master schedules were not aligned. And so Jay and um, Rebecca spent uh, last winter and spring aligning uh, their master schedules. So you wanna go? Yeah, so again, uh, thank you, Dr. Morris. We collaborated a lot. Uh, Principal Noe and I began talking about schedule collaboration actually last fall. Uh, we continue to talk about it. I probably drive her crazy when she has to explain how eat block works again in terms of what that looks like for the staff. But uh, it's a very collaborative effort. We feel really good about the schedule and I can say our staff feel really good about the schedule in terms of just how we're starting the year on a blue day. We're on a blue day, they're on a blue day. So. Um, Anything you'd like to add, Principal Noe? Um, we've just made it a little easier for the kids that need to go back and forth across to the schools and the staff now that are going back and forth. We have more staff that are going, some of ours are going to the middle school and more of the middle school staff are coming up to us. So are there certain periods or certain times of the day where you try to have the classes where there are kids going back and forth between the middle school and the high school or, or certain times when you try to have that staff transition happen? For, so for music, it is what used to be known as E, now it's third block, and we try to make it on the same day. So for example, the two middle school music teachers are coming up on the white day block three, so we'll make sure they teach those music classes then. It also allows travel time because we can control lunch, and so it gives them that travel time. And then we talk to the middle school about when Mr. LaForce will be going down to the middle school when their music is, and so we were able to tweak his schedule a little bit too. So we do. We, those are conversations we specifically have. So Michael, I think also when we look at our middle school students, particularly we have students taking math at the high school, uh, we look at the student schedules, try to make it as seamless as possible for those students and ideally they will either start the day at the high school or they will end the day at the high school. Uh, it's not always perfect, but we do talk about uh, how that works for those children. And as I had mentioned in the previous presentation, I do foresee with us having a grade five through eight world language program where we would have middle level students uh, possibly accelerating due to their world language skills and taking coursework at the high school down the road. Roughly how many middle school students will we have taking class at the high school this year? Uh, right now it's it's five okay. students and we've had as many as, you know, 10 to a dozen. Mm -hmm. I think there's five in accelerated geometry, but there's a couple more that might be in the regular geometry class too. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like seven or eight. We just got the list yesterday though that was updated by Ms. Um, Felch. 
Um, what about as far as students that um, attend the technical uh, classes at the other at other high schools? How is the schedule in terms of past years compared to this schedule this year? How will that work for them? So actually, so we have more students. We had about 90 at last count that are looking at going to the CTE centers. Mm -hmm. This schedule actually will allow them to have flex time. So most of those students take morning CTE classes. So I would I'm going to give just give a number. I'm approximate about 70 of the 90 would take those morning CTE classes. In the old schedule, they would never have flex because they weren't back in time. Now, by moving some flex to the afternoon, every student will have flex accessible to them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, they will actually be able to have advisory. So they always missed advisory. And now, because if you don't go to flex, you're in advisory, they'll be able to have that smaller community. It won't be the exact same thing that we do in that normal 40-minute block that we'll have for advisory, but they will have a time to be together with those students. And unrelated to the integration side of it, but um, Jay, would you remind me how lunch is going to work? Yeah, absolutely. So to start off the year, fifth graders and eighth graders will eat lunch separately. Uh, and the reason for that is th there's no specific concern in regards to that, but we're going to start out with sixth grade and seventh grade eating lunch together. Uh, sixth grade will start 10 minutes before seventh grade, and we're going to see how that goes. I expect it will go very well. Um, but just again, just to kind of practice what that looks like. Uh, my feeling as principal, particularly with fifth graders being new to the school, to have them eat alone and see how that works, and ideally, um, in the future, having combined lunches. So you'll start the year with three lunches. Three lunches, yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Do your lunch times line up? They're, they're actually very close in midday. Yes, they do. Not perfect, but... No. You had four lunches in the spring. You're going to three lunches, and that's because you want to give fifth grade a chance to acclimate into the building, get used to the building, and not be in a giant. Absolutely, Dr. Morse. And for us, we had four lunches last year only because of social distancing, where we also used the MPR. Um, we're going to three lunches, but the reason we don't have two is if we only had two lunches, there would be about 70 students per lunch that would not fit in the cafeteria. So we have moved to a three lunch model. Um, we did take a survey of departments last year to see which departments wouldn't mind having that middle lunch, because it does mean a split class. And there were some departments or individual teachers that actually asked to have that second lunch. Um, and so an example could be with case managers, when you have students sitting for 80 minutes and it's IEP goals or working on homework, sometimes a break in the middle of that is good. You get to get up, move around, see friends, and come back and get to work again. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Dr. Morris? That concludes my report. All right. Do we have a business, business administrator report tonight? Nope. Do we want to talk about the calendar update? Do we want to talk about the calendar update? Can you be more specific? I changed the parent-teacher workshop to November from October, right? To match the election day? It's amended August 8th. I don't think we've Is that on my list, Heather? I don't think it's on anybody's list. Oh, okay. If there's a calendar change, can I bring it to the next meeting? Because I'm, I'm totally unprepared to answer that question. David, you look like you have the answer. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> you look like you wanted to come up and speak. Right? No, we did. We it's did. blue, we so did I assume it yeah, is changed. Yeah, we changed that. That was the middle school and the elementary school principals working together to adjust yeah. the parent-teacher conference day, and now it's on the same day, and, and they have their own reasons for why they. Did we bring that. that to the board for approval? Um. Because they have to approve all calendar yeah, changes. Yeah, so we, that's the next step. I didn't know that okay. the change was we'll bring it to the next meeting. there. Yeah, so we'll have to. We'll bring it to you next time, Heather. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I, it didn't actually change the calendar because it was always a teacher workshop day. It just, just moved the workshop. So I didn't know. It wasn't that we needed to approve it. It's oh. just that. I That's thought we should say something they're, about they're, it. They're both still teacher workshop days. Students don't have school. It's just what we're doing on those days. Heather, I call those stump the chump questions. <laughs> Me being the chump. <laughs> All right. Was it meant to be hard? I thought it was in the packet for a reason. <laughs> All right, Michael. All right. Uh, we do not have a business administrator report tonight, so that brings us to the student representative.
Yeah, um, so today at the high school, Counseling 101 happened and had really good attendance, and tomorrow is Application 101, so that's going to be um, to help students who might be wanting to apply to jobs and to college, and then there's also going to be a portion specifically for seniors. Um, tomorrow is also Intro to High School for parents, and that's not going to be like a one-sided presentation, that's going to be more of a dialogue, so parents are encouraged to bring their questions. Um, Next week, Thursday the 25th, is freshman orientation, and there's going to be NHS student volunteers helping out um, for new students and freshmen to get used to their schedules, and there's also going to be pizza provided by the Durham Police Department. Um, the first day of school is going to have a slightly different schedule with advisory being first, so that's something to note, and then also um, the first week is going to be a two-day week, and then the next two weeks are going to be four-day weeks. Uh, fall sports have started, and they're going well, so there's already a busy campus. Um, and then there's just uh, some areas of the high school that have been reconfigured a little bit. The new nurses suite was already mentioned, and then also the senior core. The lockers were pushed to the side, so now there's going to be more room for seniors, also with new tables and chairs to sit and do their work during study halls and things like that. Um, and then also just new furniture in the cafeteria. The cafeteria has lots of tables and chairs and there's no need for um, social distancing anymore and there's also gonna be no need to use the NPR for lunches anymore. Have you seen the revised senior core yet? Um, the tables and chairs aren't in there yet, but the okay. lockers are moved and it looks good. Okay. I like it. <laughs> All right, thanks Paige. Uh, finance committee report. No, we meet next week. We're meeting next week. Um, all right, so then, then we'll move to the unanimous consent agenda. Is there anything on the unanimous consent agenda that anybody would like to discuss separately? No? All right, then with that, I will move for approval of the unanimous consent agenda, which includes affirming the hiring of a high school science teacher, uh, affirming the hiring of a flex school nursing position, and approval of a middle school maternity leave of absence from approximately November 8th to February 6th, 2023. A second from Brian. All those in favor of the unanimous consent agenda, six in favor and the student rep in favor, that's approved. All right. Um, in looking at the discussion and action items, the first item here is the Barrington tuition agreement. So you have a memo from me in the packet and then you have a hard copy of the current tuition agreement with Barrington in your blue folder. Um, essentially, the, the Barrington you know, the tuition agreement is Complicated. It's a. It's a. It's a. You know, it's been a very synergistic relationship, I think. But also, um, you know, we when you're talking about uh, a high school and the, the progression of students through four years, there's there's a you know, a big ramp up and a big ramp down. Um, this is a 10-year agreement with a four-year termination window, and we are. It may feel like we just did this, but we are within that four-year termination window at this point. So the question um, that I'm, I'm really asking the board here is do we want to reach out to Barrington and propose to start discussions around an extension to the agreement? Um, we don't have to talk about exactly what we would want to change about the agreement. If anything, at this point in time, we can, we can pick up that discussion as a, as a, as a non-public item, essentially, once we, uh, once we've, we and, and Barrington have both indicated an interest in, in having this discussion formally. I'm I, totally in favor of this. I think we've had a wonderful relationship with Barrington, and I think it would be a good idea to reach out and you know, start that conversation. If um, we reach out, because this is basically evergreens, right? It just keeps going and going and going until, if we reach out to them and they say, no, we're, we're fine with the way it is, does that just mean status quo or how does that? So we're at this point, one district would have to act to terminate. So the, dis so the, the, the agreement essentially extends by a year, each year automatically at this point. Um, and so it's until one district says, no, we're done, um, or, or we, we're giving you four years notice of termination, right. which, is, which is what it would take, um, it, it continues on indefinitely. I mean, I think it's worth having the discussion to see. I mean, it's been, a, it's been almost 10 years since we've written this, so it probably has to be some updates, or I'm sure Barrington has some changes they'd like to, to see as well. It'd be worth at least a conversation. Mm -hmm. If not, to technically negotiation, maybe a conversation right. between the two. Yep. So. So I, I guess I'm, I'm looking for um, 
so a, a motion and a vote from the from the board to um, direct, essentially open the conversation with Barrington. I'd like to make a motion um, for Michael Williams, our chair, to reach out to Barrington um, to um, basically open the convers open the conversation regarding our contract. Second. Right. We have a motion from Denise and a second from Brian. Any further discussion? It's a question. Uh, there's an interim superintendent in Barrington currently. Is that correct? That is correct. Is there any um, anything that we should know about sort of the the Barrington environment right now that would favor reaching out earlier or later, or does it not matter? I think that they would probably react according to where they were at. So I, I think Deanna. Then any tension there. Um, it's really, Michael's established a great relationship with David, and so um, I think Denise's motion is the right one. Perfect, thank you. And the, the interim's from in-house, so she's familiar with how everything operates over there, and ultimately it's the board's decision anyway, so. Yeah, and, and the, their board has been fairly stable. I don't see this as a, any substantial change or addition to the agreement would have to go before the voters in both Oyster River and Barrington anyway, and I don't see this as a rush thing. So I don't think we're trying to put something on the ballot in 2023. I think this is a, a the start of a long, slow conversation that maybe has a vote in 2024 for voters in March of 2024. Right, let's be clear that there's nothing like major in here that we're trying to f rectify because it's, it's just basically just updating it and. Right, I don't think there's anything yeah. broken. Right. Yeah. All right. So, um, all those in favor of reaching out to Barrington to discuss the agreement? Six in favor and the student rep in favor. Thank you very much. And then we have the, um, the community request for discussion on, um, on gun safety or gun storage safety in particular. Uh, Dr. Morris, would you like to introduce this one? Yes, um, so the parents and the community reached out to me about the possibility of um, implementing this type of program um, in the district. I am very supportive of this given our environment. I think um, the example used during public comment was tragic and real uh, where we had a fifth grader have access to a gun several years ago and um, committed suicide with it and so um, you know, if that gun had been locked up, if the parent had, or grandparent in this case, had been, um, you know, had secured it, uh, it, it would not have happened. Um, so, you know, we have a very real life example of this happening in our system, and I, I commend the parents for coming forward and, and offering this, uh, this potential solution or aspect to um, gun safety um, in our district. And um, so I'd open it up to discussion to the board. So I'm definitely in support of providing information to parents in the form of letters, you know, posters, however. Um, I have concerns about having them sign and return a form. And my reasoning is that we know how partisan things are right now, and I, I feel like um, there could potentially be parents who are very much opposed to signing. It would put the child in a very, you know, hard position, and I, I'm always looking uh, to protect the children. Um, so while I am fully in favor of including the information in handbooks, sending letters, you know, however, getting the word out, I don't think we should be asking parents to sign and return the form. Right. I, I would agree with Denise. I, I, I think the information is great to share and put into the curriculum to some extent, but um, again, having the same reasoning you have, Denise, for the uh, having them sign a form or do that, I just don't see the value in, in, or the weight that it would carry in signing uh, the form at all. So just my two cents. 
I, I think there's a, a few different directions we could go with this. There is a, you know, in the materials that the, the parent group provided, there is a, there's some educational material, there are links to education, additional education material, there's a, a proposed, uh, you, you know, um, resolution that, that the board could adopt or, or, or modify. Um, so there's, there's, we, we could, uh, we could either direct or, or empower the administration to distribute information. I think there's, there's several different possible directions that we could go with this and um, looking for a sense of what the board would like to, to do or not do um, with this matter. Um, <clears throat> I think this is fantastic. I echo the sentiments, uh, very much appreciate the parent group initiating this. And I think um, obviously we're uniquely positioned to um, you know, be a, be a good organization to get this information out there. So um, your point's taken on the, on the form signing piece. I'm not sure the value of that. I'm open to any additional information on that. Maybe it's data collection, but um, I think the important thing is to get the information out there. Yeah. And, um, and I think we're well situated to do it. Agree with what's been said. Um, both the, the value in having this information available um, and not having the, um, the, the signature to return. I imagine with the, um, all the resources of the organization that there are materials that are, um, are very much like a checklist or you know sort of action oriented materials and I'd be curious to know whether um, this is seen as an appropriate topic of discussion between parents and kids um, or whether you know this is really just intended to be a um, using the the school conduit to reach parents in particular because when I think of the handbook or I think of resources that that could go home, um, it makes a difference whether it's meant as a conversation piece that's, um, that includes age appropriate pieces or really whether it's just for adults. Dr. Moore, some of this type of information has been shared with parents in the past by, you know, as noted by, by Principal Noe and, and I, I believe by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as, you know, the right time of year or the right interval to include this in, you know, in, in the communication chain with parents? Uh, well, I think that, you know, in, when I was superintendent of Maine, we did this kind of work in the, in the fall because hunting season was right around the corner and it's a good time to remind people to store their, mm -hmm. their weapons. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's the, the fall is, you know, like October, November is the right time to say, oh, by the way, you know, don't forget to lock up your, your um, weapons uh, when you come back from hunting or you're getting ready to hunt, don't leave them out. I, mean, I think this information is really imp important. And, if, and of course, you know, it, it's important year round given the um, number of school shootings that we've had uh, across the country. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm sad to say, for a large part of my career now. Um, and so I think anything that we can do to educate and assist in, in um, the process of gun safety, I think, is appropriate because we're not. Um, we're not flying in the face of the law. We're just simply saying, hey, we, we know that guns are there. And just to remind you, to remind um, our constituency that best practice is to lock them up. So yes, we've done it in the past. We just haven't done it as a, as a, a um, resolution by the school board. Mm -hmm. And I think that the three examples that were offered, um, any one of those examples is very appropriate from the, from the school board. Um, position and then, um, you know, we can go forward and make sure the information is distributed. Mm -hmm. I would add to just, just anecdotally from what I've seen over my years is, and not just while working in a school district, but it's not just firearms, it's the ancillary things too, because there's a lot of kids that have come into school after going hunting in the morning with their dad, you know, because it's a family tradition, all of a sudden they pull out their lunch money and there's a bullet in there because they were just holding on to it from hunting. I mean, they aren't, we're planning any harm, but that can get them in a lot of trouble in school, depending on the situation, you know, depending on how the school sees it. So um, some of that training 
experience. Yeah. And you don't necessarily need a gun to fire a bullet either, because if you're creative Dramatic enough, you can figure it out. in 30 years. Dramatic changes. When I was mm. superintendent in Limestone, that's exactly the scenario you played out, Brian, is mm. the kids would have gone hunting with their dads or uncles in the morning. They show up at school. The, the rifle is in the rack in the truck. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So no, that's you know, that, yeah. those kinds of things were pretty common three decades ago. And, yep. you know, our students and staff can, by policy, cannot bring um, weapons onto school. school. Um, and so if that happened today, um, say at the high school, then um, the, the process we would use to simply say to, to the child, you know, you can't, you can't have that in your vehicle. Mike Nicolosi would have that conversation with them, and uh, he would confiscate it if it was on school property because your policy says it can't be on school property if you're a student. So that's three decades later, same scenario, completely different. We um, are, seem to be in an environment where uh, it's a gun owner uh, responsibility and informed decision making uh, is one of the, the best safety tools. In addition to um, locking up one's gun, there are there's an organization, Hold My Guns, that if one is feeling um, like the, having a, a gun in their possession might be a danger due to mental health or other uh, transitions in the house, uh, they're, they're places to Put your gun for, for free. Um, there's a also a stop gun suicide um, movement. But I wonder if not to um, overload this particular worthy initiative or to um, dilute its message. But it, I'd be curious from the community members whether um, you know, if we're putting one flyer in, it would be just as easy to put in a second for uh, for being able to temporarily and voluntarily give up one's gun if um, one thought that it might be a danger within the household. So uh, I, I think the question now is, does we want to take board action on this or do we want to leave this as an administrative opportunity? Um, like to see as administrative opportunity. They know it best as far as how it gets out there and how it affects them directly. Are you comfortable with that, Dr. Moore? I, I am. I, I think it's a healthy conversation to have. I think the, the group has provided us really um, important templates that we can be using. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time I distributed information, I think it was me looking on the internet for things that we could to do. So I really appreciate the resources that they've provided and I'll use them um, as we communicate with our parents. Mm -hmm. Other comments or thoughts? Great. All right. Thank you. Um, our next item is a memorandum of understanding for school camera access with law enforcement during a crisis. Um, this item we have we have had uh, the board has had a couple of non-public meeting discussions about this because it does re uh, pertain to emergency preparedness. Uh, the item tonight is not a, an agreement with any one particular law enforcement agency, but a, uh, a, a template, um, I don't want to call it boilerplate because it certainly is not standard. It's something that we've developed from, from other, other sources um, and, and I think improved on for our own specific needs here in Oyster River. Uh, but we're looking to approve that document so that it can be used by the administration when entering into agreements with um, with local law enforcement agencies that that uh, that serve our district, our students, and our families, um, by doing this, I think it removes the necessity of each one of those agreements coming to the board individually, which I think is, in my mind, is is acceptable and and um, efficient. So, make a motion to authorize the superintendent to enter into an agreement with local law enforcement agencies for the district for camera access law enforcement during emergency situations. We have a motion from Brian and a second from Heather. Any further discussion? This is, uh, the agreement has, has received um, some updates, I believe, small updates. Small updates. Since, since the last discussion. Yeah, today we uh, took out the undefined um, issue in it, which was during a declared 
public emergency, we eliminated that and stuck it uh, and focused it entirely on if students or staff are threatened, which is super clear. And that was um, the deputy chief here in Durham saying, I don't know what that means, Jim. And I said, neither do I, let's get rid of it. And so it's very, very narrow authorization uh, to access these cameras if our students or staff are threatened. Yeah. And I, I really think, Dr. Morris, that, that you've done a great job working with um, with the chiefs, with the with the, the police and, and dispatch agencies um, to strike that balance between having the resources needed in the event of an emergency, having the transparency you know, in, in that in that event should it ever happen here, um, while also protecting student privacy and our obligations under under FERPA and other other regulations. Thank you. So, any other discussion? All those in favor of approving the template? Six in favor and the student rep in favor. Are there any school board committee updates? None. Um, public comment? Uh, our closing actions, <laughs> all right, we, we have one public comment. Hi again, Jennifer Lyon from Lee. I really appreciate you taking up this conversation tonight. It is very important as we've heard, it's so relevant to the world we live in now with our children. Um, and I appreciate that you trust Dr. Morse to um, put this information out and I'm, I'm really glad to hear that Dr. Morse is so supportive of this as we feel so strongly that it's important for our children. Um, as far as further action for the, the school board, I can see making this a permanent practice you know, we have a good supportive board right now that is that is willing to put this information out. It would be great to set this as a pattern so there's institutional memory of these things as we go forward. So consider um, further board action in the future just to put it in writing somewhere so that it's a continual policy to inform parents and we can make this a culture of gun safety. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And our closing actions, um, we have our upcoming meeting dates here, September 7th and September 21st. I would add that we also have the, uh, the opening ceremony, grand opening ceremony for the middle school on August 23rd at the middle of the day and the first day of school for students on August 31st. Um, with that, uh, we do have one item for non-public discussion tonight, so I'll move that we enter non-public session pursuant to New Hampshire RSA Chapter 91A, Section 3, Paragraph 2, Subparagraph C, matters which, if discussed in public, would likely adversely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member of the public body itself. And this requires a second, I see a second, and then a roll call vote. Heather Smith, yes. UC Terrell, yes. Dan Klein, yes. Michael Williams, yes. Denise Stay, yes. Brian Cisneros, yes. All right. We'll <clears throat> enter non public. <clears throat>